What's going on, my friends? Welcome back to another episode of Market Watch Mondays. As always, I'm your host at Mike Me Up with Two Ps on Twitter. You can find me, holler at me, yell at me, do whatever you want, um, and I'll try and get back at you when I can. I'm recording this episode Sunday morning. Uh, it's a beautiful Sunday morning here in Northern California, and I'm here to talk about football. As always, uh, you know, I try and talk a little bit about strategy, but I think this week in particular, I wanted to go over a lot of the free agent moves and trades. It's been a pretty active uh, offseason, I would say. So I'll talk a little bit about those moves. What I think about the biggest players and the biggest moves uh, and the biggest impacts, and then also just how I approach the strategy in terms of making trades and making moves upon that type of action and on, on top of that type of news in the offseason. Uh, but before we get to any of that, man, y'all know what time it is. Hit that intro. <clears throat> All right, before we get started with this week's episode, first of all, I just want to apologize real quick for last week's episode. I know a lot of people pointed out that Charbonnet was incorrectly in the rankings, which is 100% true. So that's my bad for that. Basically, how I create those rankings, though, is I have a composite list of every single player. So all my Devies, all my rookies, all my players. And then I move them within those ranks correspondingly. And then like I just do an automatic formula pull for the rookie ranks that's based on like what I have them in my database at. So when Charbonnet didn't declare, I moved him down my composite ranks. But I forgot to change his draft class eligibility in the database from 2022 to 2023, which is why he still got pulled into my rookie ranks. So um, if you look at the composite ranks, like he would have went down, but because I, I missed that data uh, entry error. Uh, he basically got pulled into the rookie ranks, and then I pulled him in, put the table down, and then I had to go, and I was traveling, so I couldn't actually re-upload the video. I was able to fix the rankings right after, because that's an easy Excel fix, but I didn't have any of my gear and shit. I was in Utah like snowboarding, so I couldn't really upload. So my apologies for that one. Uh, to those of you that got uh, that saw that, uh, that's a... Uh, I guess that's a, yeah, it's just a just big, 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 big mistake by your boy. Apologize for that. Next time, I think I'll probably just pull the episode and then like re-record it later and then it'll get released at a later date, uh, which is probably better than uh, releasing an episode with a mistake in it. So again, it's my bad. Thanks to those of you, those of you guys in the comments that pointed it out. Uh, won't happen again, or hopefully I'll try my best not have it again. Not have it happen again. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's really just like a data poll thing. So I don't really actually like build rookie ranks. I just build composite ranks and then everything pulls for me. Uh, that's just kind of how I like to do it. Cause I like to have all the ranks communicate across the different tiers. But yeah, anyways, apologize for that. Uh, but moving on to this week, man, there's a lot of moves this week. Uh, not this week, sorry, this off season, just in terms of like the big, big moves. Like, I mean, we already had, you know, Russell Wilson and, and Aaron Rodgers obviously resigned. So it wasn't a move, but it was like, you know, it was up in the air, uh, big news. And then we and then we had Russell Wilson go to the Denver Broncos, which you rarely see, man. You rarely see quarterbacks that good go into, uh, like, get, get moved from team to team, right? So I think that was really interesting. But there's even more stuff happening now. And before I get into the individual players specifically, I want to talk a little bit about my, like, general approach to offseason, right? Normally, you don't have to worry about it too much because there isn't that many crazy moves in an offseason, a lot of the notable players, good players get re-signed. Um, so you don't you don't see too many things blowing things up. But I do think this year is pretty unique in that a lot of really star players, you know, uh, players that are kind of in that, like, top 100 of your dynasty rankings are making a lot of moves, either, you know, re-signing, getting moved, traded, going to free agency. So um, how I think about it is I kind of break it down by, uh, by player category, right? So running backs is probably the most interesting one that that moves a lot because running backs as you guys know there's really only one running back on the field at times time there's only one ball obviously so the opportunity is very very dependent on how many how many times they get to tote the rock right so if someone if a big free agency signs they make a big draft pick like that can crater your value of running back so for me i tend to not make giant moves at running back until the draft is complete because if let's say you make a move for, for running back that, that signed a contract or went to a new team and, and you think they're going to have a workhorse load. And the next thing you know, that that team is drafting a running back on day two. And then, you know, all that in, all that investment you put in them is really, really going to be subject to tanking. And what I'm trying to do in the offseason is try to limit the amount of moves I make that expose me to downside price error. Right. So. 
running backs is, is the probably the prime destination for that type of fiasco happening. So just because your favorite running back got resigned or your favorite running back moved to a new team and you thought they're going to get a new opportunity, I would not, I would really, really advise against paying like top market value for that player because the draft is still yet to come. And as we've seen in years past, none of us know what the hell we're talking about, right? The draft happens and shit hits the fan, right? You think you think they're not going to draft running back? What happens? They draft AJ Dillon, right? Even though they need wide receivers. So there's there's all these other things that we just can't account for. I, I will say I will make an exception when there's an opportunity for asymmetric risk reward, which I'll talk about later on with some of the players. But for the most part, I'm not looking to pay top dollar on positive news of running back free agency, right? Because there's just too much unknowns. On the other hand, wide receivers is a little bit different because wide receiver is a very talent driven position and what i mean by that is if you're not good you will not get targets so it does not matter if you go to a team with no competition if you're not an elite wide receiver not a good wide receiver you will not earn the composite targets in order to make you good because for unlike for a running back where your team just has to choose to hand you the ball right for a wide receiver not only does the quarterback have to choose to throw it to you but you have to make sure you beat the defensive back or the double coverage or what have you whatever they're throwing at you on the defensive side so for wide receivers they're a lot less risky uh in terms of their uh how would i put this their downside price risk to the draft right because if you are a top end wide receiver it's unlikely that a rookie will displace you. Like, unless, you know, we don't get Jamar Chases every year, right? And, and even if you do, even if you do get a wide receiver on a team, it is very possible for two multiple good wide receivers to coexist on the same team and still produce. If you have a good quarterback, you have a good offense. A good offense is good for everyone involved, especially for the wide receiver position. So, wide receivers, once I kind of see how those things shake out, I'm more willing to kind of make a move uh, and make a bigger move on those wide receivers and go and acquire them versus a running back. And, and it just comes down to risk reward because of the imperfect information we have, right? We don't know who's getting drafted. We don't know what's coming. So in order to protect myself against that, I'm looking to invest more in positions that have a better ability to hold value in the face of incoming competition. So that's really how I think about it. And then, you know, quarterbacks obviously very straightforward, but there's barely any of those moves uh, in the offseason anyways. If a quarterback goes to a good team and you think they're going to be a high passing volume, good offense, obviously it's good for the quarterback. And you look at the surrounding weapons, they have good, good weapons, obviously it's also good for them. Um, and then tight ends also similarly is more come down to opportunity, but also in order for tight ends to really excel, like you got to find a team that actually utilizes the tight end. Uh, so, you look at a team like Oakland, right? That's why Darren Waller was such a popular target because they've shown that they can make guys like, you know, 30, however old Jared Cook was that year when he uh, popped it off in Oakland, he was able to produce because they funnel targets to the tight end position. You still have to be good, obviously, uh, but tight ends is, again, it's like if the if you get to a team and you're kind of locked in and that team utilizes that tight end, that's very, very attractive. But I don't really focus too much on tight ends. The most interesting part is the running back position and the wide receiver position. You can see the the differences in the way that I treat those two positions when it comes to free agency and trades in the offseason, all right? So just to recap there real quick, for running backs, do not pay up for positive free agency news right away, right? Don't do not do not pay the maximum value or even the fair value. If you can get it for a discount, great, but do not even pay the fair value for running backs because their value can still crater come NFL draft time. For wide receivers, different story. If they go to a team, you like them, it's a good wide receiver, it's fine to pay up that price for them because even in the face of competition, there's more uh, than one wide receiver on the field at a time. And if that's an, if they are a really good wide receiver, which is the only reason you should be investing in a wide receiver to begin with anyways, then you're not really scared of competition coming in. Like you do not want to, I guess the other way to put it, like, which maybe isn't as obvious to people, like a lot of people chase the situation for the wide receiver, right? They say, oh, well, there's this many vacated targets or, or, oh, he's going to a really good team now. And even though he sucked before, he's going to be good. That's not at all what I'm looking at. If I'm looking at wide receivers, I'm just looking for good wide receivers. If they're a good wide receiver, the situation can elevate them, sure. But the base case has to be they have been a good wide receiver that proved, that has proven production in years past. So, that's what I'm looking for. If they do not, if they do not meet that criteria, I don't really care as much about like the vacated targets. I don't think that's that's real to an extent. But I don't care about the vacated targets, any of that type of stuff, right? I, I care about baseline. Are they a good wide receiver that has proven production? All right. So that's the two different ways to think about the two different lens to think about the different groups of free agents that are available. Now, let's break it down 
uh, group by group. I'm not going to go through every single one because there's a ton of uh, free agency moves. If you guys do want to track all the free agency moves, though, uh, track uh, the PFF article. It's by Ari, uh, a.k.a. at my sports update on Twitter, uh, the GOAT you know, news updater uh, for fantasy, for not fancy for football in general, but he is like a free agency tracker that has all the free agents where they're moving, where the trades are by team, by position. So that's a really useful place. And I think he's constantly updating it, um, but I'm not going to put every single player in that. I just want to talk about the ones that I think matter the most. Right. And when it comes to running backs, I think so far, the biggest news for me is James Conner resigning with the Cardinals. Uh, why? Because James Conner, when he was with the Cardinals was a highly productive running back, right? But what makes him more interesting is that they re-signed James Conner and then let Chase Edmonds walk, who and he he signed with the Miami Dolphins. So James Conner re-signs for three years, $21 million, uh, which is really probably more like a two-year contract because they have an out after the second year. Uh, and I don't see them like not taking that out because James Conner will be... 28, 29, uh, I think, by the time he gets here. A little bit older on the older side. But here's the interesting thing, right? Here's the splits of James Conner with and without Chase Edmonds this past year. James Conner without Chase Edmonds was a league winner this season. Uh, he grossly outproduced his ADP, and he was a monster on a points-per-game basis. He scored 23 points per game. He was getting 5.6 targets, 5 receptions without Chase Edmonds on the field. Now, the other part of his production this year was he was scoring a ton of touchdowns, which obviously I do not think will continue going forward. He was scoring like basically one touchdown a game. Um, so you know that regression is coming. But the interesting thing, thing there that I'm focusing on is without Chase Edmonds, he was getting a ton of targets. 5.6 targets per game is pretty damn good at the running back position. So here's the thing, though. like The Cardinals definitely can still pick up a running back in the uh, in the draft. But that money is pretty good money. Uh, you know, three years, $21 million is not backup money. Um, and he's been, he's proven to be pretty good when he's on the field. And he has the workload volume, workhorse volume when Chase Edmonds is not there. So I'm interested in James Conner. And the reason why I'm interested in him is because the cost is not yet outrageous. So I don't think you have to pay maximum value for James Conner uh, because he's older, right? He's, he's already an older running back. So based on age alone, the fantasy community is going to treat him like he is a leper. So these are the low risk, asymmetric risk reward upsides I'm talking about where I'm still not going to like be paying max value for James Conner, right? But if you're looking at that group, that bucket of older running backs that I think can produce and make a big impact on your team, I think he's really up ahead in that pack. Him, James Conner, Leonard Fournette, uh, these types of players. Um, I think James Conner is probably a good target right now. I think he is currently going based on keep trade cut at pick 105 at running back 27 so so an rb3 uh which is a pretty good value considering when he when he does not have chase edmonds on the team with them he could be looking at like top five points per game production so james Conner has been pretty productive uh, over the years when he has been healthy obviously health is the other issue but he was able to play through all last year even if he i mean i i kind of view him as mostly like a one-year rental so if you're not a top end contending team you do not care about james Conner. but if you are a top end contending team and i think every a lot of my teams this year will be trying to compete at least He's going to be a great target to be had. I don't think you have to pay a first-round pick for him. You probably can pay a second-round pick. Maybe there's a wide receiver that someone likes, a rookie wide receiver someone likes on the board that most likely will not make an impact. I would take a swing on a James Conner. Now, if he was going as a mid-round running back too, I would be much less interested. But at that low price of mid-RB3, mid I think he's a very, very interesting thing now. So if you look at the Cardinals, they have picked 55 and pick 87 and then nothing until pick 200 so that's why i think it's interesting because if they were to make a running back pick i think it would be in that like fourth round range right maybe late third range so maybe they use the the pick 87 but the thing is if they use pick 87 on a running back which they just invested 21 million dollars in then there's a lot of other holes that they're not filling cardinals have a ton of holes on defense um on offense they just lost a wide receiver so um now it's two wide receivers. AJ Green is a free agent and Christian Kirk uh, got signed by the Jacksonville Jaguars. So I do think that they're going to have to invest in other positions to support Kyler Murray than the running back position. They saw, you know, Benjamin as kind of that, you know, late round draft pick, some receiving ability, like basically a poor man's Chase Edmonds. Um, so he, you could see 
Keno, you know, Benjamin kind of take a bigger role, but he's just not as good as Chase Edmonds. So I'm not as concerned about him. So I think all those factors combined make me think that even though there is still risk of them drafting someone with maybe that 87th uh, pick overall for now, it seems like James Conner does have a realistic and likely path to a workhorse volume. So that is one running back I am interested in. Just to touch on a couple of the others. So um, Chase Edmonds, like I said, he went to Miami, but so did Raheem Mostert. They still have Miles Gaskin there. It's just a very, very ugly backfield to be a part of. I mean, Chase Edmonds was really good in the two games that Connor didn't play when he was by himself, but I don't see how he can become a, you know, a, a meaningful threat in that Miami offense, especially if Raheem Mostert plays, takes the first second downs, and then Chase Edmonds is kind of like his role in the Cardinals, but maybe even like a poor man's version of that. So I'm not too excited about that. Not to mention, Miami has a ton of picks. So unlike the Cardinals, Miami has 29, 50, 102, 121, 125, 158. So those one, those 100 to 125 picks, so those three picks in there, I could easily see them picking up another running back that they like that has some receiving upside. So that is not a signing that I'm very excited about. So Chase Edmonds actually tumbled down my ranks quite a bit um, because like his role there is just not, frankly, not even as good as what he had uh, on the Arizona Cardinals. At least on the Cardinals, with a very risky health, James Conner, he had that opportunity to kind of step up. Um, but for now, I'm not very interested in uh, in Chase Edmonds. So those are the names that have like signed that I really care about. Some other names that haven't landed yet that I'm really you know keen to look out for is Ronald Jones, Leonard Fournette. My guess is they probably re-sign Lenny, so Uncle Lenny becomes the workhorse back in that offense. Like I said, like James Conner, I don't like Leonard Fournette as a player that much, but as a one-year rental, as a contender rental, I think those are two guys that can become a really, really solid running back two option on your team, especially if you kind of go with that build where you draft a hero running back, you know, one top end running back, and then try and backfill the other position uh, with, you know, with cheaper vets or, you know, PPR guys or stuff like that. I think Uncle Leonard, and James Conner are like those guys for me. Um, and then you have Rashad Penny, who was also a free agent, I believe. I don't think he signed yet as of this video. Uh, if he does, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what the information I have right now. And then obviously, uh, Melvin Gordon. I think those are the notable guys to look for because those are the guys that can still make an impact. And that's why I don't like going too heavy on running backs early, especially now. Like, so, you know, if you were to. Uh, if you were to look at a team and you said, oh, wow, like, look, Raheem Mostert's gone, right? Uh, so, you know, the natural tendency there would be say, well, Elijah Mitchell has to shoot up our ranks because Elijah Mitchell was really good last year. And he was really good last year, right? But I'm not confident enough that, like, they don't either sign someone or use one of their picks. Like, San Francisco has pick 61, 93, 105, 134. As we've seen last year, they, you know, they got Elijah Mitchell with a dart pick. So, who knows what happens there? And also, you have Debo Samuel there, who is always going to cap the receiving upside of any running back that lands there. So that's why, like, I've I've te- I've typically been a little bit lower on Elijah Mitchell in my rankings uh, than anyone else because that risk is still there, and it's not I'm, like I'm not certain what's going to happen with that with that backfield, especially with the draft coming. Like, there's always a wild card there in San Francisco, which is interesting because. I was a lot higher on Elijah Mitchell as a rookie coming in, so I had a lot of him. But now that he's like kind of hit that, you know, really high value and creeping into like that top 80 uh, pick range, like I'm more than happy to trade away Elijah Mitchell. You know, maybe you can get a first round pick for Elijah Mitchell any single year. Maybe you can get multiple, you know, a, a bunch of second round picks for Elijah Mitchell. I think those are all trades that I would explore, um, and I would much rather pay for a cheaper James Conner, right? That's the thing. Like I would much rather get James Conner plus for an Elijah Mitchell. I would much rather get you know maybe uncle Leonard, uncle lenny plus for a elijah mitchell because i i think i think wherever rojo penny and melvin gordon land that's gonna cause some uh headaches for someone i think i think the buffalo bills makes sense potentially for one of these guys especially for like a rojo who sucks ass when it comes to uh catching passes but he has objectively to me been a much better runner than uncle for uh leonard fournette uh on the tampa bay Bucks. so i'm excited to see where he goes and then melvin gordon you know everyone loves to hate on melvin gordon but he's been a consistent producer his entire career so uh who has receiving upside so those are the guys i'm looking out for now moving on to the wide receiver group this is probably the most interesting or at least one of the most interesting off season for wide receivers at least that i've come across because of all the re-signings and all the good uh, really good players that move and potential revivals of some of my favorite players which i'll get into but the first guy on the block 
Devontae Adams, five years with Oakland, $141 million. He said he was not going to play on the franchise tag with the Packers. The Packers could not come to an agreement with him. Apparently, it was reported that Aaron Rodgers knew when he was signing that he would most likely not get Devontae Adams back, which is surprising to me because that is his favorite target. And these two have arguably been the best receiving quarterback duo in the NFL for the past couple of seasons. So, uh, what do I have to say about Devontae Adams? Am I moving him a lot down my ranks? No, I am not. Um, I, I do recognize, though, that his 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 probable um, path to the wide receiver one overall is definitely declined a bit without Aaron Rodgers because he doesn't have that touchdown upside, right? But Devontae Adams is still absolutely elite and the best wide receiver that Derek Carr has ever played with, uh, including going back uh, to... It was earlier days. So I would say that Devontae Adams at the at Oakland is going to be a monster, right? They have not had a true wide receiver one. Darren Waller has been the true wide receiver one over there. So it'll be interesting to see what this means for Darren Waller. Hunter Renfro, definitely going to take a bad seat. Brian, Brian, a.k.a. Terrell Edwards, a.k.a. Randy Moss Edwards, is definitely deceased. So um, Devontae Adams going there is going to be a problem uh, for, for most people. But it will be a big boost to Derek Carr. So I still have Adams. Um, I already had Adams behind Cup. So I think maybe this move, the max I would do is like, kind of move Adams to where Stephon Diggs are, where Stephon Diggs is in terms of their impact. But uh, he's not going to be falling too far back. I think, like I said, when it comes to wide receivers, if you're an elite wide receiver, you can get it done. And Derek Carr is not a bad quarterback. Derek Carr is an average to slightly above average NFL quarterback who can get it to his players. And the problem with Derek Carr is he doesn't really push it that deep. But Devonta Adams is not necessarily your deep, deep player, right? He's a great, like probably the best, short to intermediate uh, wide receiver. Probably the best slant uh, in the NFL is Devonta Adams because he has the dirtiest release. But I think that'll be a very, very good pairing uh, for time to come. And I think Derek Carr will pepper him with targets. So I still expect Devonta Adams to get absolutely blasted with targets. But if we think about ancillary-wise, what this means is um, we, we saw a little bit of an uptick at the end of the year for someone like Josh Jacobs who started getting more involved in the receiving game. I expect that to not really continue going forward because now you have Devontae Adams, you have Hunter Renfro, you have Darren Waller when he comes back healthy. So I think Josh Jacobs most likely reverts back to that, that two-down grinder. But it does mean that is more upside for the offense overall because uh, more sustained drives is better for everyone. So Devontae Adams, uh, five years, $141 million. Congrats to you, sir. You deserve all the money that you got. Godwin, Mike Williams, both re-signed for $60 million, uh, with Tampa Bay and with LA Chargers, respectively. I think it's really big, uh, it's really big for Mike Williams. Um, he started off really, really hot last year, tapered off a bit, and then started playing with the injuries again. Um, but sticking with Justin Herbert is crucial. Uh, so I think both of those guys had a W. I would say the other guy I want to talk about, uh, one of the other guys I want to talk about is Allen Robinson. So Allen Robinson, three years, $45 million as the number two to Cooper Cup. Why is this important? Because Bobby Woods is gone. So Bobby Woods going to Tennessee. So Allen Robinson is going to step in and take that Robert Woods, like Odell Beckham role. Because Odell Beckham's obviously already gone as well. And as the number two on that offense, I like this a lot. This is the best quarterback that Allen Robinson has ever played with in his entire career. We've all been waiting for this moment. Allen Robinson to get a good quarterback. And as the number two, he is going to be a stud. He's a great perimeter wide receiver. He can play internally. He can play anywhere on the field. And if we if we were excited about Odell Beckham going there, which I was, um, I think Allen Robinson going there is even more exciting uh, just in terms of what they are at this point in their career. I'm a big fan of Allen Robinson. And he's currently going as pick 114 as a wide receiver 47. Uh, I think that's way too cheap. So as a contending team, if I'm looking for that wide receiver three, wide receiver four on my squad with weekly wide receiver one, wide receiver two upside, it's hard to find a better target than an Allen Robinson. Uh, so I'm very excited. Uh, I rem remember what happened when Bobby Woods first landed uh, with the LA Rams and Tron McVay. Like he was coming from the Bills where most of us thought he was washed and not really good anymore. And then he went to the Rams and became an immediate low-end wide receiver one, high-end wide receiver two. I think Robinson has that. I currently have him ranked much higher as my wide receiver 33 overall. Again, the, the, the ranking specifically doesn't matter. It's more about the tier. He's in a group of guys I think he's really, really good that both, that all have that you know high-end wide receiver two upside. 
obviously he's a little bit older. People might think that he's washed. I don't think so. Uh, he does rely, you know, a little bit on his athleticism, but also he's a very good route runner. He's always been a standout in Matt Harmon's reception perception. He's always crushed it in every single facet of the field. He's a great contested catch guy. And we know Stafford is one of the one of the guys, one of the few quarterbacks in the league that don't care about slinging it up to his guy. So I think it's a really, really good matchup uh, between those two guys, a really good offense as well. So I'm very, very excited about Allen Robinson to the LA Rams. Personally, I'm going to make, a lot of moves to try and acquire him. I think what this means for the rest of the depth chart, though, is that, uh, I mean, Van Jefferson's dead, I would say. Uh, I said that when Odell Beckham out there. He still had, like, a, I guess an okay year. Um, but Allen Robinson going there, uh, I, can't, I think really, really kind of cements the fact that, like, he's not the guy, right? Like, Van Jefferson's not the guy. It's very clear that, you know, they've tried to bring in Odell Beckham. You know, they had Robert Woods. Robert Woods is gone. So Van Jefferson at best is going to be the wide receiver in the offense. Does that make him fantasy relevant? Maybe. I don't really care. Uh, what I do care about, though, is Allen Robinson. If he had, like, Allen Robinson could very, very easily have a top 15 finish next year. And uh, that would not come as a shock at all. And I think that's very much in his range of possible outcomes, like reasonable, realistic outcomes. So he, I know he's a little bit older, obviously, but yeah. I think, you know, given the discount of what he will be to like, you know, Devonta Adams, Cooper Cup, Stephon Diggs, I think that value is absolutely there. All right. Uh, another player, Christian Kirk, four years, 72 million with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, on the surface, this probably looks pretty good because, you know, he's getting the opportunity to kind of like uh, become the lead guy there because they don't really have a, they don't really have an alpha. They have LaVis Chenault, they have Marvin Jones Jr., and they have Christian Kirk. Um, but Christian Kirk is not an alpha, so we know that. And he has not proven not even to be a not not proven to be pretty disappointing over the past couple of years, mostly in flirting in that like wide receiver three range. And when wide receivers change teams, normally I am not that big of a fan. But I'm not worried about Devonta Adams because he's a god. I'm not worried. I'm not as worried about Allen Robbins because he's proven he can do it before. But when it comes to Christian Kirk, that's where the warning signals kind of start getting shot up. Like people think he's gonna go Jacksonville, become the lead target, whatever, whatever. I'm a little bit more hesitant. That's coming from someone that actually really liked Christian Kirk as a prospect. Um, but they still don't have an alpha. The offense is still awful. So I don't know how fruitful this is. He's currently going as the pick 115, wide receiver 44 on keep trade cut. So only one pick below Allen Robinson. I think there should be way more separation between Allen Robinson and a Christian Kirk. So given the choice, I would much rather pivot to an Allen Robinson, even if I have to pay more to get him. So I'm not too interested in Christian Kirk at his current price. Um, well, I, what I am more interested in is probably Michael Gallup. So Michael Gallup, throughout his career, I think he's been a pretty decent wide receiver, but he's just always been like that third guy, uh, kind of getting sacrificed a little bit when Amari Cooper went there. So if you understand the offense of the Dallas Cowboys, um, and I understood this by watching some of the tweets and um, breakdowns, by I think it was maybe it was Jay Moyer. If you guys don't follow Jay Moyer, 100%, go on Twitter, click on him, follow him right now. But they use Gallup as almost like a sacrificial lamb. They always kind of line them up, line them up outside on the island by himself, uh, and then give Amari Cooper and CD Lamb the much easier underneath routes, right? But obviously, with Amari Cooper out of town, now you have CD Lamb and Michael Gallup, and Gallup got signed for five years, 62 million. So they, they said, hey, like we want to keep Gallup on the team. CD Lamb has yet to emerge kind of as that true alpha. So, you know, there's a not there's like a there's like a chance that Michael Gallup can outproduce CD Lamb this year. I know, I know that sounds crazy because of how good CD Lamb is, but I do think that at his current price of wide receiver 39, pick 113. Michael Gallup is a pretty intriguing guy that I want to go for because over there in the offense right now, it's basically CeeDee Lamb, it's Michael Gallup, and it's Dalton Schultz. Now, is there a chance the Dallas Cowboys draft somebody? Uh, definitely possible. Maybe they get like a Trillin Burks or maybe they get one of the wide receivers in this class and Michael Gallup's again gets sacrificed to the wide receiver, uh, to like that outside lone island wide receiver role. But... I think at the cost, I've always been interested in Michael Gallup. I didn't know where he would go. You know, I always thought like, hey, he could be a great fit. Uh, Green Bay Packers lining opposite of Devonta Adams, but obviously Dallas wanted to keep him. And, you know, being attached to Dak Prescott is not necessarily a negative thing. So for me, I think I prefer Gallup. I would much rather target a Gallup, even though he's more expensive than Christian Kirk. I would much, tar much rather target him over a Christian Kirk because I think he's got a little bit more upside. Now, Fan favorite, uh, maybe not fan favorite, but channel favorite, Juju Smith-Schuster finally going to Kansas City Chiefs, which is what should have happened 
last year. If you believe the stories, uh, how it went was basically he wanted to stay with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Who knows why? But now that Ben is out the door, it makes sense that he's more willing to go to Kansas City Chiefs. And the Kansas City Chiefs, outside of the Green Bay Packers, there is no other team that has needed a wide receiver to bad more more badly than the Kansas City Chiefs. They tried the McCole Harmon experiment; it has failed. They've had Byron Pringle, uh, you know, all these other guys out there. Make no mistake, Juju Smith Schuster in Kansas City Chiefs. Chiefs is the third target. He's not going to out target Travis Kelsey uh, unless Travis Kelsey gets injured, and he's not going to out target Tyree Kill. But he fits so perfectly into that offense because if you think about Tyree Kill, he is an elite deep threat, right? And then Travis Kelsey is obviously working the short to intermediate, but they do need a wide receiver that does that as well. And Juju Smith-Schuster, if you think back to his glory days, he is not an elite separator. You cannot put Juju Smith-Schuster on the outside and ask him to beat press coverage one-on-one. But what you can do is put him in the slot and with Andy Reid and the creative offense, that he has installed in all the movements, all the motions. I really, really love this role for Juju Smith-Schuster, right? Going in as a second guy, replacing him with Cole Hardman, as Tyree Kill stretches the field, as Tyree Kill, uh, as T- Travis Kelsey draws cover, there's going to be a lot of good opportunity for Juju Smith-Schuster to do catch and runs, which was his bread and butter. If you think back to early days Pittsburgh, when he was lining up opposite of Antonio Brown, who was a true alpha there, that's when Juju Smith-Schuster really excelled. He got the, the you know, beating the zone coverage and the shorts underneath. He's a big guy. He's fast. He's hard to tackle. So getting him the ball in space has been very, very fruitful. And I think he can do that when he goes to Kansas City Chiefs. He's currently uh, going uh, kind of in that later round picks as well. But I have him kind of as a wide receiver three. But he's one of those guys that, like Allen Robinson, even though he's there, I think he can easily provide like that wide receiver two upside. So I'm excited about Juju Smith-Schuster. I mean, Kansas City Chiefs have needed a wide receiver two for the forever. And Juju Smith-Schuster is just a great fit for that i know a lot of people have probably given up on Juju smith schuster because he's been not very good in the past couple seasons been playing hurt he's just not been effective and you know he was asked to be that you know wide receiver one guy and he isn't that you know deontay johnson went and proved that he was that guy so but now that he's with kansas city chiefs i think this is going to be a pretty good revival for his career i'm very excited about what he's going to do this season so again if i'm on a contending team even if i'm not a contending team i think Juju smith is a great target he's he's only 25 years old and that's why he like if you guys remember he was like at one point the dynasty wide receiver one overall because he had such elite early and early on production obviously that fell off because he proved that he was not able to make that transition to become an alpha and become the leading wide receiver of the team but he's not being asked to do that here i think the Chiefs know exactly what he is. The Chiefs know exactly what they need. And I'm trusting in Walrus, a.k.a. Andy Reid, to make use of him in the way that he was meant to be used. Okay, so Juju Smith-Schuster, Kansas City Chiefs. Absolutely love that. And then, you know, the last guy I want to talk about, Amari Cooper, uh, traded to the Browns. Uh, so, you know, on the surface, that was probably, you know, you wouldn't think that's good. But we also know that Deshaun Watson signed with the Cleveland Browns. So it's going to be Deshaun Watson to Amari Cooper, potentially to Will Fuller. There was some talk about Will Fuller having interest, having mutual interest. Obviously, we know the Deshaun Watson and Will Fuller connection. One of the best, one of the most lethal, when healthy, one of the most lethal uh, connections in the NFL is Deshaun Watson to Will Fuller. So, it's kind of excited to see what happens in that Browns offense. I don't know how excited I am about Amari Cooper uh, going from Dallas to the Browns, um, but, you know, it, it, it is what it is. I, I think I'm much more excited about some of those other guys that I can have for much cheaper. But, you know, getting attached to Sean Watson for the next five years uh, or, you know, however many years he's playing there uh, is going to be a positive in my book. So that's what I got for the wide receivers. I'll quickly touch on the other two positions. So tight end. I think probably the most interesting signing here is Zach Ertz. Got extended three years, $31.65 million, uh, But they do have an out after two years. So, again, think about it more as like a one- to two-year rental at the tight end position, which is barren. So it's not, it's not that bad. Um, I would say, you know, we know that Christian Kirk is gone, right? And so it's just DeAndre Hopkins left. So it's very possible that Zach Ertz can become like that second secondary target on the team. You know, they saw Rondell Moore there. Maybe they draft another wide receiver as well. But, you know, in terms of thinking about cheap tight ends that can be had, uh, Zach Ertz kind of comes to the top of that list for me. So I think Zach Ertz is interesting. Obviously, Schultz, he got the franchise tag. Seki got the franchise tag. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, Noah Fant got traded to Seattle. So... 
not too excited about that uh, because now you're you got DK there, you got Tyler Lockett there, you don't have a quarterback, no Russ, no offense. So um, it's going to be down, down, down for Fant, unfortunately. And then Hurst, uh, Cincinnati, who cares, other than the fact that he wasn't taking too many targets from uh, Kyle Pitts anyways, but I guess with him out of the way, maybe frees up some of the red zone opportunities. I think Hurst, uh, Dylan, uh Oh, Hurst had about three touchdowns last year, and it was. I remember it was frustrating to watch because I was like, "Why are those not going to? Why are those targets not going to Kyle Pitts?" Hopefully, with him a little bit out of the way, we'll see a little bit more of that going there this time. But for now, um, those are the only interesting things there for quarterback. There's a couple interesting moves. I already talked about Deshaun Watson. The only other thing I'll add is I think it was like five years, 230 million uh, guaranteed. So. Uh, pretty insane. But the the thing that people got really tripped up about is the first year salary. I think it was structured to only be one million for 2022. The reason why I do that, in case he gets suspended, he doesn't get paid. So you know, there's a chance he gets suspended, and you know, people are mad. You know, rightfully so. But am I surprised? No, because in the NFL, there's always someone that's willing to do everything, whatever it takes to win. Uh, so morality and all that shit doesn't matter if you're a really really good player and can help a team win. We've seen it. Time and time again, like the NFL, there's always going to be a team that does not care about the morality of stuff as long as it helps your team win. And we see that here. So, and Deshaun Watson is a top five quarterback in the NFL right now, and he's in his prime. So no surprise to me that people are willing to make exceptions and cut corners for him. So that's about that. Uh, Trubisky to the Steelers, probably, I would say this is like more big news than actually it should be in terms of impact uh, on the field because... He barely got back on money. I think he got two years, fourteen point two five million. Right? That's like that. That that's like not much money at all. Obviously, he kind of like you know fumbled his job away in Chicago Bears. Spent a bunch of spent a bunch of time uh, behind Josh Allen. Maybe that helped him because they're a similar style of quarterback in terms of early on not having much accuracy. But you know Josh Allen is a unicorn, so I wouldn't really expect too much uh, from that. But the more interesting thing here is like the Steelers still have a pick at pick twenty and. Based on a lot of the draft mocks uh, that I've seen, like this quarterback class is kind of still in the air in terms of where people are going to go. Um, you know, will Coral be there? Will Strong be there? Um, will, uh, you know, Howell will be there? There's still kind of opportunities for Steelers to draft a quarterback. So I'm not, at this point, I'm not assuming that Mitchell Trubisky is the starting quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Okay. So, and there's still a couple of free agents out there as well. So we'll see what happens. I think. To me, what it looks more like is that they signed Trubisky to be a backup, maybe a one-year stop bridge. Maybe they'll draft someone and let Trubisky kind of start the reins and not feed the rookie to the Wolves. But I'm not that excited about the signing here. But um, the most impactful, obviously, is Deshaun Watson. You know, for those of you that have followed my ranks, I've always had Deshaun Watson uh, higher than consensus uh, because, again, it just comes down to asymmetric risk reward. Now. Do I love the fact that I have Deshaun Watson on my teams because he's a shitty human? No, but I'm playing the game to play to win. So uh, if you're playing to win, you know, you're trying to get the best players. And Deshaun Watson, when healthy, is a top five dynasty quarterback, right? And so I always had him a little bit higher on the off chance that he did get cleared and he was able to play or this wasn't like a lifetime ban from the NFL, which, you know, obviously now it seems like it is not. And now that that's passed, he is going to be a top five quarterback for me. And he is... Sorry, not five, not five, but he is quarterback six. But again, that ranking doesn't really matter. He's in that same tier as Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray for me. I think he is that caliber of quarterback. And the only reason why he's not ahead of them is because he might get suspended or, or you know lose a couple of games in this first season. So that's about it. I think Deshaun Watson getting traded does bring Davis Mills his stock up a little bit. Uh, he played okay, you know, as, as a rookie last year. Uh, who knows if they sign someone else or bring in someone a rookie? But for now. Davis Mills looking like a potential starter. So that's somewhat interesting there. But other than that, man, like I said, it's a very, very, very busy offseason. There's still moves to be made. Again, look out for those free agent running backs. That's what I'm going to be paying attention to most. Where does does Uncle Lenny get re-signed now that Tom Brady is back? Does Ronald Jones uh, go to a team that, you know, offers him an opportunity to become a lead back? You know, where does Melvin Gordon go? Do they, does he stay in Denver and ruin, or sorry, not, not stay in Denver, but where, where does Melvin Gordon go? Because where he goes can be an absolute thorn in the side of any running back there. As we saw with Jamal Williams last year, like he is going to uh, leech touchdowns. He is going to leech receptions. He is going to leech carry. So I think those are, when it comes to the remainder of the free agency season, those are the guys that I'm going to be looking at most. All right. 
And I think that's all I got. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this week's episode. If you did, make sure you hit the thumbs up, uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications. So you can see anything that's coming up in the future on the channel. Make sure you guys tune in to the dope videos that Noah, Noah, and the Godfather himself also post on the channel uh, throughout the re remainder of the week. Um, and until next time. Uh, peace.